start recording also so now we are recording okay so i'll just uh, introduce uh, dr partho chakraborty who happens to be my classmate from this stat but that doesn't limit his potential so partho uh, did his phd from cornell and uh, subsequently also did a executive program from harvard he has worked quite a, for a quite few years for lehman brothers and also i think nomura was it nomura but nomura it was yeah. it was nomura but uh, partho in his current avatar is more known for being an entrepreneur he was part of this uh, startup called switchboard systems in blockchain mm -hmm. and he has been part of a few other significant ventures partho is currently ceo of infinite water incorporated so i requested partho to tell us about uh, blockchain applications particularly in finance which we know very little about so partho over to you and thanks a lot for waking up at this unearthly hour for me. thank you dr uh, professor mukherjee and uh, uh, good good evening uh, friends and uh, first let me compliment you by saying that you are in really good hands both at isi and also with with my friend and i am honored to call him my friend and uh, professor dinanth mukherjee and he is an excellent excellent guy and as i as you have all know for last 5 years is that is the place to be and i mean i cannot say that enough that the the place i would be an uh, undergrad and doing undergrad and masters in india is still isi no matter no question asked so i'll just introduce myself and thank you uh, professor mukherjee uh, giving uh, a little outline i mean my focus on switchboards uh, on blockchain came with switchboard systems now switchboard systems was a technology company blockchain 3.0 technology company what that means is that yeah, it had a patent uh, patent table patent table technology called uh, open master systems developed by the founder of the company uh, a gentleman named patrick egan and uh, i'll come to that point later on Uh, um and that says a lot about the question that where blockchain is going and how blockchain will um as uh, as a way to way of the future is it really the way of the future that will cons um consume quite a lot of my talk today um right now i am part of infinite water incorporated and iqb also which is my sleeper blockchain company right now i'm no longer with, with with switchboard systems so uh, um, the way i, I like to uh, go through into today's talk is that i would like to talk about how this blockchain thing started and it stuff started for just not for me for everybody in the uh, in among the people who are working on there and then i will spend a lot of time on blockchain applications and finance because that's where the emphasis is going to be because uh, and then i'm going to spend a lot of time on are we there yet the point of are we there yet and where we are going and why are we not there um i will probably spend uh, the first five or six bullet points i'll gloss over those things because i know that for the for the audience of this speech um of this talk um blockchain is not something completely unknown so i would gloss over these things but i'll bring out a few things which are relevant for uh, um where things are right now and where things are going to go i mean that will be my focus of my talk today where things are and where things are going to go <clears throat> so in 2008 essentially this was the comes of the internet um back in 1991 uh, as professor mukherjee will remember um, when we started using internet you know there was always the promise of internet being where uh, people have access to and everybody has has an internet domain and people are going to find their uh, their vendors and their markets through the internet that almost did happen but did not and so that is the small cut out in the picture that says that, that it actually did not happen completely there is a gap so what was the gap 
So the gap was that, you know, um, people did have, right now people do have access to uh, the internet. Every single person, every single entity has the, uh, some, uh, some existence on the internet, just like previously people had access to the phone. But that does not mean that there are no, uh, uh, there are not the uh, intermediaries, the Googles, the Facebooks, or whatever you call it. So uh, um, those intermediaries are getting capturing the economic rent, and that is a very critical point because internet was supposed to drive down the uh, economic rent to zero. No, it has not. It has given rise to trillion dollar companies. So somebody is catching uh, this thing. So what happened, a very interesting coincidence in one month after Lehman Bank bankruptcy in New York, um, uh, somebody, we don't know who, uh, um, wrote and uh, they identified themselves as, as Satoshi. Satoshi wrote a paper called Bitcoin and, and that's part of the uh, reading list that I assigned. Um, my uh, focus today is not to go through the paper, but the paper mathematically proves uh, how we can set up a trustless system, trustless system, so that uh, transactions can be conducted without any, uh, without any, uh, any governing authority. Uh, so Bitcoin, the paper or Satoshi did not start to develop blockchain. He started to develop a, uh, a cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. And in the process, he developed a uh, technology that I think is far more critical, that is blockchain. And the blockchain is the technology where you can actually make sure all the transactions are, are that are happening, and you don't have to get it governed by the, um, or monitored or um, by a governing authority. So uh, there are quite a few things incorporated in there, and I'm not, uh, this is not the talk to go through that. Uh, there's a huge amount of cryptography, there's a huge amount of mechanism design, something you guys are covering right now. Uh, and so, uh, there's a lot of distributed storage, but let, I will gloss over those things right now. And I will say that this is, blockchain is essentially a set of protocols. This is how I, I understand it as an, as an insider is a send, as a set of protocols that enables us to create immutable distributable database of decentralized consensus mechanism. All the points are very important. The decentralized consensus mechanism, that is the most critical part of blockchain and any DLT, that is decentralized ledger technology. Um, I will gloss over this uh, page, and uh, this is a, just a pictorial depiction, and there are many very good uh, depictions how blockchain works. So uh, let's go to page number six. And so um, th these are some of the highlights of what a blockchain or a DLT technology typically looks like. Um, so there has to be a consensus mechanism. How do you know that a uh, transaction actually happened? How do you know in a traditional sense? Uh, you go to a bank, ask the bank. Yeah, banks go to Central Monetary Authority, the uh, Federal Reserve. And similarly, for every single transaction, you have some kind of a governing authority that authorizes that it happened. In blockchain, it's a trustless system. That means that you, know, you don't trust nobody. You trust nobody at all. And as a result, you have to have a way to develop the consensus that something really happened. So consensus mechanism, defines defined blockchain technologies. And we're going to come to those points later on. Um, the third, third point is that they can be closed, open, or hybrid. The ideal blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, is completely open, completely open. And in your assigned readings, there have been some examples where they talked about how uh, uh, there's a tier system of uh, permission uh, closed and closed and, and completely open. So um, Bitcoin blockchain is completely open, but there are uh, closed blockchains, for example, R3 CEP, that is for permission uh, of finance, used very much in finance, and I'm going to come to that later. And there are anything in between. And on all blockchain uh, uh, platforms, there are a smart contracts that make sure that things actually work. Now, smart contracts are just APIs. I mean, you can think of them as APIs that make sure that uh, if A happens, then B happens, then 
and A or B happens and C happens, so on and so forth. That, that's all smart contracts are. That, those are, that can get extremely complicated, but you know, um, the principle remains the same. As a student of ISI, you know, you can create really complex systems from very simple um, structures. And um, the one point that gets very interesting is that um, blockchain, is, which started from the point of saying that there is, has to be a trustless system, actually end up being a very good decentralized system for trust. And I will spend some time on that later. And uh, the last point is that blockchain is not financial. Again, that is going to be very important later on. So, uh, why are blockchain important? And as a student of economics, as uh, Professor Mukherjee and I were, and Professor Mukherjee still is, but I'm not. <laughs> so, uh, so, so th this is the part that is most important. So why do farms exist? And why is it that uh, internet gave rise to trillion dollar companies? Why these intermediaries uh, suddenly came up? The reason, uh, you can trace that reason uh, that uh, the understanding to a paper by Ron Coase, a Nobel laureate, and he rose, wrote this very seminal paper, 1937. I have not assigned this uh, as part of the reading because that's more economics, but um, the paper is called The Nature of the Farm. And he identified why do farms exist? Why is it that people know many things are more complicated inside the farm, more uh, costly inside the farm, if then, farms do exist. Similarly for blockchain companies, why do blockchain companies, or, or similarly for internet companies, why do they exist? The reason they exist is that the costs of organizing and, um, are much lower inside the farm because of the governance structure. So what uh, essentially means that, you know, you go to a company and you say, okay, can you do this? Can you do A, B, and C? And the company says, yes, I can do A, B, and C. And you look at their uh, size, you look at their reputation and say, oh, well, you really can do A, B, and C, so I'll uh, let you do A, B, and C. Why can't you do that to a uh, person on the street? Because you do not know who that person is. You do, there is an identity issue, there is a knowledge issue, there is a governance issue. Now, if you were to decentralize all the companies and if you were to disintermediate all those intermediaries, then you have to find a way to trust everybody who comes here and says that, hey, I am the best plumber you are going to get ever. Uh, okay, so what kind of jobs you did? Do you have to visit all the houses to inspect all the uh, things? That's a problem. That's a huge cost for you. And you probably are not going to trust that thing, right? So that person's identity as a plumber is immediately questioned by your or the system's lack of ability to go into every single house and check the quality of the plumber, plumbing work. See the point? So the information and the asymmetry that is there that gives rise to uh, the possibility of somebody, an intermediary coming in and setting them up. And that happened, uh, that happened a lot recently in, in, the, in, in the internet world. And I don't have to go through any, uh, go through them, but the idea of gig economy is the fact that we are uh, trusting somebody intermediary and then trusting them to verify each and every uh, last mile, whoever is coming at the last mile and telling them I can do the job. For example, at 4 a.m., there are there have been hundreds of times at 4 a.m. in the morning, I uh, went out of my house and, and somebody drove in and somebody stopped the car on the street and I went into their car at 4 a.m. in the morning. I'm completely sleepy. I slept uh, through the airport and uh, woke up at the airport 45 minutes later. So for me, I go into somebody else's car, complete unknown at 4 a.m. in the morning. Somebody else comes to my neighborhood complete. They have never been into, in my neighborhood. They come at 4 a.m. in the morning, fine. So how can that happen? That is the trust issue. And um, I would argue that every single entity you are seeing here, and also there are many more, countless more, is that they are nothing but a trust engine. 
This is the same reason that Ron Post talked about. Why do corporations exist? Corporations exist because essentially they establish a trust and governance between the between various levels of economic activity. And um, same with Uber, same with Upwork, same with Airbnb. I mean, I, I have taken Airbnb quite a few times, and uh, there have been a few times which, where I was unhappy. But the thing is, overall, I still can complain. I still can uh, make sure that you know that uh, that thing gets addressed at some point. So, uh, so uh, take away from on the, this slide is that the reason all those big companies exist, they are trust engines and. They can have a fancy GUI. They can have a way to use GPS. They can have a they can have a payment system on, on the side. All of those things, if anybody can um, can uh, put together uh, at a much cheaper price, they don't have to be Uber. They don't have to be a billion dollar company. No, they don't. The reason they did uh, they exist is because they are trust engine. They happen to be after so many millions of uses of this of their platform. So uh, this thing uh, was is not unique to commercial world also. Uh, this is very much in the political uh, world also. So on the left hand side is a typical you know, feudal world where there is one lord and forgive me for uh, for saying that it used to be mostly lords at some point in time. And uh, the feudal lord is sitting on top, and then uh, he is uh, he is medita mediating between two warring parties, and that is supposed to be this picture: the some Mughal um, emperor is sitting on the on, on the throne. On the right hand side are where we give ourselves the power to govern. Now, what it is is that if what is the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side? On the left hand side. The Lord said so, and that's why it happened. If the Lord says you are a plumber, then you are a plumber. No, nobody, nobody can question that you are a plumber because the Lord, Lord said so. You know, if Lord said somebody, something happened in the past, nobody can question. Lord said so. It's not so now. We the people have given ourselves the uh, same uh, the uh, same powers. How did we do that? To our constitution, constitution. All countries are essentially, at a core level, they do the same thing. They give the power of the lords, the government, the trust, the identity to us. So we trust each other. We tell who we are. Our identity, our trust, and governance are dependent on me. But we have, as in the previous slide we saw, we have not managed to do the same thing for the commercial world. So. What is it that what is it that the uh, um, any constitution actually does is that they give each other self-sovereign identity, meaning that we are um, we are final arbiters of our identity. You know, we define who you we are, and I'll come to that identity point in a minute. But all rights and obli obligations come to me as a person because who I am. And the other thing is the right to freely organize and assemble. Of course, this is a um, constitution of a democratic government of, in, of a reasonable type, India and the US in, you know, included. But uh, it also gives the right to organize freely. And that's an important part. And that is not there in the commercial world. That is there in the political world. That's a crit um, very critical difference. And self-sovereign identity is also not there in the commercial world. That's why we need the intermediaries who are nothing but the lords. And uh, there's a... So I'm sorry? Question. Yeah, I had a question. Yeah, the, way you, the way you argued for the rise of intermediaries, it could also... So the point you tried to make, that could also like uh, facilitate firms who uh, like favored uh, vertical integration of, of the entire supply chain. That, we are, that could also be a way of... Uh, their business model. So why is it that uh, the, the uh, intermediaries, intermediaries existence are more ubiquitous than the vertical integration model of companies? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, and I would argue that uh, in, uh, those intermediaries uh, is actually exist in the vertical 
in one uh, specific particles. For example, Airbnb in, in one particle of things. For example, Uber is one particle. Uber is not trying to be intermediary of everything. So there is a, um, there is a reason why uh, it has not uh, gotten into, Google actually is trying to be uh, the intermediary for all industries, but I'll come to that point later on. And I'll say why Google, I can come to that point later on why Google is different from um, from Uber or Airbnb. But your point is absolutely right and a very good observation. And I'll hold on the other observation and come back to it at the end of the uh, talk, if I may. Is that okay? Okay, okay. Then. So uh, what is identity? Identity, whatever I define myself to be. And that's too simple to say. And also very, com very complex. For example, I, as a person, can have many identities. For example, with Professor Mukherjee, you know, outside of this class, we are very good friends. We have a diff very different identity of each other. And this uh, particular class, he, he is the professor. I'm uh, uh, doing that. So my identity is very different from the identity I have with Professor Mukherjee outside of this class. My identity as a profession, uh, professional is is uh, that identity is defined by which companies I work for, what I did as a in the commercial world. That is a completely uh, irrelevant identity when I talk about with uh, with my family. They don't give a shit. Well, mostly they don't give a shit uh, what I do in the professional world, and the professional world don't give a shit what I do in my personal life. Typically, you know. So there can be many identities. But identities, I have control over what items I put into the identity. So the way I think of identity is, identity is nothing but a collection of memories, collection of happenings that happened. And that collection, that set, I have the power to define. There can be many subsets, and I have the power to define those subsets. I have the power to put in those elements in there. And that's how I define my identity. Now think of it this way, go back to the plumber, okay? Somebody comes to the city and says that, you know, I, I was the best plumber in another city, fine. How do you define it, okay? You have no, uh, uh, I, no past happenings, no history, no memory of that. So how, how, do you def uh, how do you make yourself to be the best plumber in the other city? You cannot. But if there were a way to keep all those memories in a completely indelible form, say somebody carried a paper that says I did this and this, and there's a signature of the person who who was their who was their um, 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 client, and uh, if. Uh, everybody carried a piece of paper like that, that would be one way to define them professionally. But then you have to carry bags and bags of different papers and it's going to be completely messy and you don't know which paper is right because you don't know, you, you don't have instantaneous way to verify if that, that signature is a right signature also. So you see, the uh, memory, indelible memory is an important part of an identity. So it's all, as a result, trust is all, uh, is, you cannot trust that person's different definition. You cannot trust that piece of paper because you do not know what the, what the other person, where, where the signature came from. You do not trust that signature. So all of those trust identity issues are completely interlinked with each other. And this problem did not happen in the uh, feudal world because that's, that's the, that was the time when the feudal, feudal law defined exactly who you are. You had no choice and nobody else had a choice to question that. So that was simple world. But this time it is a much more complex and nuanced world and technology does not have a way to identify them. It was very easy in the political world because political world we defined uh, that we are who we are, we are citizens of this country and we give ourselves the power to assemble and, and, and so that was much more simpler. It is not possible yet in the commercial world. But think of it this way, think of also the possibilities. What technology, what is the technology that ha that can give rise to that uh, possibility? Blockchain can, because blockchain has immutable uh, memory. 
blockchain can because blockchain is also completely decentralized. There is no governing authority. As a result, if there were one technology to disintermediate identity and trust, one technology to take care of Uber and, and Airbnb and all those things, that is blockchain. Okay, and that point is very, um, when I realized those things, that was like a huge aha moment for me. I mean, I cannot imagine how much impactful it is for me for coming from economics, mostly economics uh, to the blockchain world, why blockchain exists, you know? I understand a little bit of uh, mathematics that goes into blockchain. I understand a little bit of the technology that goes into blockchain, but I am completely wowed by the economic possibilities of blockchain. So uh, those, um, this is the future in, you know, without being very specific is that uh, blockchain has three features. It's an indelible memory, it's a reliability, and it's a self-filling. Blockchain inherently, uh, open blockchains are inherently self-filling. So they can, uh, you cannot really attack it without going into to be, uh, without, uh, without exposing yourself or without uh, harming yourself also. So as a result, it can uh, do the self-sovereign identity so, and with any smart contract over it, that's very easy. And so the self-governance, and that is our distributed self-governance are the uh, ideas that have to develop almost organically. It is not a, uh, it is not a, a technological issue, it's a governance issue. That's also an uh, important aspect of any feature of blockchain. And if it is possible, then you can, it, you can do pretty much everything on blockchain. And uh, I'll, uh, I, I will skip the third block because that is going to constitute much of my later talk. But essentially, the, I mean, for anybody who, has, who is not a technologist by themselves, blockchain is a world that truly can transform the economics as we see it. And that's a, that has huge, huge potential. <clears throat> So uh, um, what I'd like to spend uh, um, time now for the next half an hour or more are uh, financial uses of blockchain. Now, at the bottom of this page, there is a quote from somebody, Frank Abagnale, and anybody has seen the movie uh, Catch Me If You Can, Frank Abagnale was a con man and he used to forge checks. Um, and he was extremely successful and he started doing this as a teenager. And he also used to uh, take different personas and he was a doctor, <laughs> he, he was a pilot, he was a this, that, without ever a lawyer. Um, I think he did pass the bar at one point, but other than that, he had no qualification on any of them. He didn't even finish high school. So this guy was the uh, con man of excellence. And uh, later on, he actually turned himself around and he became, and he started working for FBI and uh, developed some very important, uh, very important uh, protocols for uh, for security of the financial services. And, uh, you know, um, so he uh, did something that he is, I mean, you know, he, he gave a speech one day. He, this is a guy who has no uh, background in technology. Only background, only thing he does is that it now helps banks escape the con men that he was before. So he said something very interesting in one of the speeches and I heard him and I'm like, oh, wow, that means something. And he said, you know, it, it ha you have to be pretty ignorant to, to realize that uh, is not to realize that blockchain is the way of the future. It is the best way to store information. It is secure 100%. And as a result, banks and accounting practices, account firms, they will all move to blockchain. So that was the idea that also went into all the C-suites of all the financial services companies. I mean, these are just some examples. And uh, um, this was representative about three years back. And, but you know, the, all the companies here are still involved in some way or the other. So uh, what, uh, before I go to the next uh, slide, I would say what they tried to do is that they tried to gather themselves into different 
groups r3 c p is one group uh, um there was uh, uh, they came up with a protocol called corda um, and there there are quite other uh, others and what they were trying to do is that they were trying to either develop uh, networks by themselves or they were trying to develop protocols on which other uh, financial services all financial services companies can write uh, write their own use cases now you have to realize that financial finance companies are extremely extremely protective of their uh, how they do things everyone has reinvented their own financial uh, systems internally and uh, you know they spent literally billions of dollars in the name of security and there is no one standard structure i mean yeah people do use uh, oracle people do use this and that but uh, everybody is completely own fifta of their own so when they come together and they form groups that's an important aspect but then it also says uh, for example for r3 which almost is there no more I mean, people are uh, desert, uh, uh, people are going away from r3 almost every week so uh, you have to be very careful of developing a, an underlying protocol that is applicable for every one of them and i'll come to that point remember this what i just said and i'll come to that point later on so uh, now that we have established why blockchain can be important and let's see what can be uh, uses for as uses for example re retail finance i mean i personally also switch board system to work on loyalty programs so um, the on the point of the the business business uh, uh, issue that is that loyalty programs once spent um, should not be usable again anymore so you know you, you cannot reuse loyalty program programs but it happens all the time and uh, billions of dollars are lost so on blockchain because it's of its indelible memory uh, you can create uh, you can put loyalty programs on blockchain so that they cannot be used remember that blockchain was developed in the first time by satoshi to make sure that uh, you know the um, the uh, cryptocurrency cannot be reused cannot, cannot be double spent we have to prove to offer the same thing mortgage finance this is a very very important aspect um i don't know how long it takes to close a mortgage in india i never uh, uh, had any exposure um in us even in the best case circumstances it takes 3 weeks typically it takes 2 months so that's a really long time why because there are many layers of documents one layer of documents are title insurance so for example if you have to take and take a mortgage somebody has to give you a trust that your ownership of the of that plot of land building whatever you have you is uh, what it is so there are those intermediaries called title insurance companies uh, whose only job is to go ahead and literally search the title that are kept at the municipalities or whatever the authority whatever level of authority that is and um, they can come back and say that, you know we have not found anything contradiction any anything contrary to what is being claimed out here as a result the mortgage company believes and mortgage company gives you the loan the whole process can take a long time and most often because all of uh, all of this ownership started long back i mean in, in my kind case i mean uh, this particular plot of land uh, that my house is right now the ownership first started in 1878 and imagine that 1878 somebody uh, somehow had claimed ownership of this plot of land and since that time um, it went from one one person to another and all those things and somebody has to go through and find out all the way to 1878 and research the and prove essentially title companies uh, prove that that you have ownership of that plot of land or building so that's a very labor intensive process um you can put all of that on blockchain as i said before you can make it many many times faster and in your assigned readings there is a reading that says 
uh, you know, you can you can have a five six billion dollar industry built out of that. I think that's a very much of an understatement. I, I would expect that to be much more. Micropayments lending, once again, the same thing, you know, why can you not uh, go ahead and give 100 rupees to the, uh, the rickshaw puller over there? Because you don't know who that uh, who he or she is, mostly he, and uh, you, you don't know where he is going to go, you don't know how he's going to spend the money, and if you don't know, you know, if he is going to uh, give you the money back. And that's why the Grameen Bank came up with a, a very interesting uh, angle from the opposite side, peer-to-peer -peer lending and peer-to-peer -peer monitoring. But assume that if there is no peer-to-peer -peer monitoring, assume that you know, that person, uh, you know, there is no, there is no trust, it's a trustless system. So how do you monitor that? You can do that on a blockchain, but you have to remember that also uh, presupposes quite a few things. For example, uh, uh, their own identity, for example, this person says, I, I am part of Chakraborty and I, I uh, ride this, uh, ride this rickshaw. But how do you know that person is not Diganta Mukherjee from a different town? You don't. So you, you have to assume quite a few things. So, um, but in theory, you can do that at a, at a certain point. Mobile banking, I mean, uh, mobile banking is uh, getting to be a, a, a or people are trying to put them into into blockchain because you know uh, we use our our phone as essentially as our identity. All our identity is on the phone. So why can you not uh, use that identity as a way to give you money? Mobile banking. People have not. Uh, I have not seen a single product that has done significant work on this. So I'm still you know I think they are working on the technology issues right now. Money transfer, particularly for or Africa, particularly, particularly for places in Asia, particularly for places in Latin America, it can be a huge opportunity. And already people are doing that in Africa specifically. Um, uh, they, are using, uh, they are using mobile ca uh, cash transfer. So it is not on blockchain yet, but at some point when uh, that, that money transfer gets moved into moved into financial, other financial transactions, I can definitely see that getting into blockchain. So that's the retail finance. What about capital markets? Now, capital markets, no matter what you are trading, and there is a very good assignment reading for that, uh, DLT in retrospective and perspective, there is a very good reading for that. Um, and also Goldman Sachs readings is, uh, piece is also very good on that. So no matter what you are trading, you can trade as complex instrument as you want, but what you need to do, you have to make sure that there is somebody that is, that is A, verifying that you are, are asking for 10, 10 securities, uh, 10 securities, B, if they have to verify that you have money to uh, commit, whether now or later, depending on the structure, you have to, uh, somebody has to confirm that there is another side of the trade who has the, uh, the capacity to deliver 10 trades. You have to reconcile uh, in groups of all of those trades and you have to actually transfer money. So there are quite a few states. And typically, I mean, uh, right now it is T plus two. Uh, when you trade, you expect, about 95% of the time that uh, the, uh, the trade is completely settled, money transferred and all those things in two days. But still, that is too too long because, you know, right now in, uh, in the people are talking about nanosecond trading, like literally, I don't know how they do it, you know, but people are talking about nanosecond, millisecond trading. And that's, that's a, uh, when you talk about all those trades and then T plus two settlement, that's a huge, huge uh, burden on their part. And um, people, if it was possible that everybody was on blockchain and, uh, and those kind of verifications, once again, the time it takes is because of the verification and reconciliation. And, and uh, so if those things could be put on blockchain and that can be really fast. So that was the idea. And that's why uh, people are working on that digital asset holdings, uh, um, which is on, which is, was started by uh, somebody I know, Sunil Hirani, 
is tr trying to do really good work on that. Uh, uh, there are some good works in being done in Australia. Um, then there is uh, underwriting. That's a that's a at least fifty billion dollar industry. So underwriting is essentially making sure that you know uh, you market a security that is being underwritten, and you take the opposite side. You provide some some price guarantee, you know, and uh, some liquidity to that uh, to that security. On that count. One thing that is important is that who you are marketing to, that has to be a qualified individual or an entity. Okay, you cannot just go and uh, stand on the mark on the street corner and say, "I uh, hey, I have a new company. I'm going to sell 50 security, 50 shares of that." You cannot do that. And uh, so, essentially, what uh, the problem here is that identity: who is a qualified investor? How do you know they are a qualified investor? How do you make sure that you are trading, you are giving that information only to qualified investors and nobody else. How do you make sure that you know you uh, get their indication of price and then the, everything else comes in? So at the core of it, it's still a trust game. See, many problems in finance are essentially a trust game. And that's an important realization and that's a realization that I had uh, before I started into blockchain, you know, that it's nothing but trust and identity game. And if there is anything that can be, um, any technology that can address that thing is blockchain. Know your customer and time money laundering. Of course, it's a trust game. Of course, it's an identity game. And it's a highly, highly labor intensive game in the United States and pretty much everywhere. I mean, and people can go really wrong on that i mean i have done i have gone really wrong on that so oh, i paid price and you don't have to if it is everything is on blockchain so if you can identify trust and identity you can address trust and identity all of those capital markets and retail finance problems can be solved and the way to do that is blockchain similarly with insurance exactly the same thing you know uh, how you know what particular uh, risk you are insuring? If it is a uh, if it is a commercial building, fine. Who owns that commercial building? How much of the risk you are uh, taking? How much of the exposure are you taking? If you are talking about a, uh, uh, insurance on a person, okay, fine. How do you know that person is not smoking? How do you know that person is not? Uh, uh, they don't have a, a pre-existing condition. I mean, those things are extremely important, right? I mean, um, just as an aside, I was without insurance for 10 months because I had a pre-existing pre condition. And that's an important aspect. So uh, once again, the, those kind of, uh, of issues, the fraud issues, the potential misrepresentation issues from both sides can be uh, very easily solved if everything were on blockchain. Again, trust, identity, blockchain solves that. Um, some other use cases I have seen uh, use, uh, people are trying to do land registration, particularly in Estonia and Bermuda. They are trying to, uh, uh, and, and also some parts in India. I think India, um, is it Karnataka, which is uh, moving it to blockchain? I forget, but anyway. Uh, personal identification, uh, birth and death certificates, all those things can be on blockchain. And particularly if your identity is defined by your blockchain identity, that avatar, then all of those things have to be on blockchain. Um, food distribution, people are already doing that for particularly for legal cannabis. And that's a very big uh, market where blockchain actually is being used. Mm -hmm. it, it is actually being used. Audit, uh, people can do that. Hyper local bespoke offerings, and I know some people try to do that. Um, so the idea is that you move from one, you are just walking from, uh, from say, uh, say Bonhugli and you go to one download. So the uh, and you are looking at your screen and the kind of uh, restaurants that have come up on your screen as a possible uh, possible suggestions differ as soon as you move from Bonhugli to Dalla. So that can happen. 
social networks that's uh, if your identity is defined by blockchain there is no reason social networks cannot be on blockchain i'll skip this next page and the idea is very simple uh, very simple is that we are at various technologies had uh, absorption at the different levels on the right hand side at the very end and this is an old graph is that bitcoin is at a very early stage i mean less than 1% of us uh, us households have any knowledge of uh, any knowledge tangible knowledge of of bitcoin right now blockchain right now so i let me spend a lot of time on why that is so and uh, that will also give you as you set out on your career on your on your passion to think of why that is so what can we do differently yeah so um, as uh, a participant i have been a ceo of switch for system for about almost 2 years and my sleeper kind sleeper i iq is doing various stuff on blockchain and uh, trying to do various stuff uh, on blockchain so uh, are we there yet and ask me directly and i'll tell you in your face as a participant that no we are not there yet we are nowhere close to being there so then you ask me the question why blockchain has been there for over 10 years now right 2008 satoshi's paper was 2008 um by certain measures about 46 billion dollars of of capital has uh, uh, that ha has been committed already to blockchain ventures globally 46 billion dollars compared that with google um by the time google hit the uh, unicorn status how much money was was committed to it less than 230 million dollars okay so google made this thing happen with their own thing it was uh, their it was just one company 230 million dollars before uh, that was committed not spent by the way that was committed before they became a, a unicorn you know why is that we are not seeing any blockchain applications the first reason is very simple it is too tied to bitcoin and that uh, uh, the fault partly lies with the community with our community because initially it was very easy for us to say bitcoin and blockchain are the same you know there are some very good research papers and very good uh, industry documents that are that also uh, presuppose that point they did not mean any harm but they actually did a lot of harm at that time because bitcoin whatever happens to blockchain people say oh bitcoin is going up right now it is at what 15000 us dollars okay that's interesting and then bitcoin goes down to 6000 oh bitcoin uh, blockchain is no more blockchain is uh, no good so we have been too much tied to bitcoin and blockchain those are completely different things bitcoin is also a blockchain one of many blockchains but bitcoin is also a cryptocurrency and i will uh, tell you my next point is that bitcoin as a cryptocurrency is a complete joke is a complete joke because of very for very reasons for quite a few structural reasons you cannot you cannot have bitcoin as uh central bank currency you cannot because uh what is the main thing that central banks do they regulate the flow of currency into the market can you do that on bitcoin no you cannot structurally you, uh, how many new bitcoins are issued is defined by how, how they are being mined um the other point of uh, any central central bank currency is that you know potentially the total amount has to be unlimited bitcoin it is not it is what 21 million right now we are already at 18.7 so bitcoin is not going to be a central bank currency is it tradable asset yes us government says it's a tradable asset but anything can be traded you know um if you structure any uh, in a proper way anything can be traded in united states and most in uh, many parts of the world so just because it's a tradable asset does not mean it's of any significance as a currency 
And uh, if you ask me point blank, what's the value of Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency? I'll say zero. I'll say zero because there is no application that. Uh, I, so long as I cannot go to my bodega and buy uh, um, buy um, a sandwich with cryptocurrency with Bitcoin, there's no value to me. Well, I'm being facetious, but you get the point. So Bitcoin is, so the point is that Bitcoin is actually trivializing itself into irrelevancy. The third point is also a very important point is that undercurrent of anti-establishment mindset. The whole idea of, of cryptocurrency initially, even the Satoshi's paper was that, how do we create a trustless system that we uh, trust is built as a, as inside the system, not because I trust you. There is a trustless system. So you have to have a proper verification. That kind of undercurrent of anti-establishment is the number one sentiment that drives every participant, particularly from the technology side of, of things. And there's no middle ground. And that is why, that is why there are so many different approaches. They cannot have everybody thinks they're you know, better than everybody else, even though from a third party point of view or from uh, somewhat intelligent uh, outsider point of view, you say, why are we doing this this way? Because they are anti, there's a huge amount of anti-establishment. You cannot create industry standards. You cannot create a product, consumer facing product, if all you believe, you know, uh, are looking for your next burning man, burning man uh, get together. You cannot do that. And that's a, that, that was a huge realization for me from an outsider, because I thought I kind of understood what uh, cryptocurrency was, but it, I did not ex, um, get into the, uh, apprehend this level of, uh, of anti-establishment thing. And as a result, they are reinventing the wheel many, many times. As, um, in a previous slide, I showed you all the different you know, uh, you know, financial services players that are are gathering it themselves into five, six com competing uh, groups. Why are there so many competing groups? They're trying to do exactly the same thing. They're trying to uh, also start from the uh, from the same you know open blockchain, completely open blockchain uh, mindset. So why do we have to have five, six different? Because because just the way there is, you know, um, from the financial services com com company's point of view, they want to be the leader. If somebody, if my if, uh, $500 million investment gives me the uh, the industry leading structure, then I get a billion dollar product out of that. That's, that's very good. But the thing is, you are trying to reinvent the same things again and again. There is no, no effort to develop an industry structure. The next point is kind of sounds facetious, but it's actually very important. Electricity is not free. And right now, just the mining activities of, of Bitcoin, just Bitcoin mining, not all blockchain, that uses more electricity than Facebook, Google, and Amazon together globally. Can you imagine that just the mining? And another point of, uh, of uh, point is that Bitcoin also is being pulled into six or seven pools. And, and um, I think 80 plus percent of Bitcoins exist in on those six or seven pools. Now, if you go back to Satoshi's paper, the reason the system is cannot be broken is that you cannot have uh, an app that has more than 51% 51% uh, uh, participants, it is very likely it can be possible sometime soon. And that, that's also an important point. And one of the assigned readings said that Bitcoin is nothing but a way to transfer money from China to outside the world. And I think there's a lot of validity. I am not going to be quoted to saying that, but I think there's a lot of validity to that. So the last point is that, you know, um, for so many, uh, because of so many things that I already said, uh, and also because Bitcoin by itself is a very novel technology, you cannot have, 
you cannot put the ROI in front, front of a, a top executive. You cannot put an ROI in front of top executive. Right now, banks have invested the $50 million, $100 million, and they have said, you know, we have, we have nothing in front to show for it. So and we are done. That, that was the limit of our, our risk appetite, and we are done. And that is another reason why right now, the, you don't see any new big projects, where blockchain projects coming up. So are we like completely, uh, blockchain is completely done? No, no, absolutely not. I personally think that blockchain is the technology of future and I'll come to that point in a minute. So, but what can we do? Um, we are working on a social media, uh, via, on social media that is based on blockchain. Uh, IQT is working on that. So it is possible that can go into a viral. I mean, on social media, either it goes viral or it, or it goes bankrupt, right? So, uh, the idea is that if you can catch people's attention, people's interest, saying that, oh, that's an interesting um, little app, and then you reveal that, oh, it was actually built on blockchain and uh, uh, so the features A, B, and C that you are seeing right now is, uh, is possible only because of blockchain. And that's when I think that's a good way to get acceptance of blockchain at a very higher level. Then the other point is that uh, um, very specific commercial apps, for example, Carfax. Carfax is a, a way to get information on used cars. And Carfax, the company, spent 40 years trying to uh, develop the relationship with every single, uh, you know, every single uh, mechan mechanic and, uh, and repair houses. And so that they actually voluntarily transferred that information to, uh, to Carfax. And after that, Carfax is not in, nothing more than a database. So if it was, it can be completely put in on blockchain where people are going to be trusting that if the, uh, the mechanic says that I am going to put that information on blockchain and I will have control who sees that. And uh, similarly, I as a consumer can say that that mechanic is a, a real mechanic and that mechanic actually worked on car that I'm looking for to buy. So that can be a very important way to do that. And uh, something I know people who are already doing that. And uh, I talked about underwriting, I talked about capital raise. And uh, right now, all of them are trying to be done on on a much larger scale and failing, what about doing it at a much smaller level? What about a group of people who are already together because of whatever association club they have created and uh, make applications, fundraise applications just specific to that? And people are doing that, I know people are doing that. From a technology point of view, quantum computing is going to be the valid game changer. Right now, Bitcoin blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain does about seven or eight uh, transactions per second. Can you imagine how, how silly and slow that is? So um, each, of, each of MasterCard and Visa, they do over 30,000 30, transactions per second. So uh, at some point, quantum quantum computing come, can come in and uh, that number can be multiplied by a thousand times, 10,000 times. But remember, MasterCard and Visa, they are also working on, on, on quantum computing. So the competition also gets much harder. So there's, there, there's a trade-off. So, so what are the takeaways from uh, today? I mean, we are already almost uh, half, uh, one hour. So first thing is that many of cryptocurrency, whether it is, uh, uh, it is Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies that, have to, that has to stop, that has to stop and fundamentals of investing are not being followed. When I did my PhD thesis on market manipulation and I can see those charts and I can tell that if I were to run the same one, uh, analysis on those charts, each of those things or quite a few of those things are being manipulated right now. Bitcoin definitely is being manipulated right now. Um, the, the next uh, takeaway that I want you to have is that there are going to be many blockchains. 
the uh, the blockchain world is not going to have one single blockchain one single open everything blockchain it's not possible it's not feasible there are going to be many different blockchains and uh, they're going to have their different value propositions i can see many permission and private blockchains coming up um current uh, current blockchain solutions are not too much better than a database based system you know uh, right now the right now uh, about 1.6% that's the uh, cost of trans uh, a transfer of money on blockchain 1.6% and uh, that's over 1.5% that uh, that uh, that western union charges for international transfer to the most remote village in the world that's over 1.5% you cannot survive on 1.6% transaction cost and that does not include cost of electricity by the way so so you you take that into account um i think we have to come up with killer apps we really have to come up with killer apps both from the consumer point of view but also from the commercial point of view and uh, initial killer apps are not going to be mega size and uh, um, do everything kind of they are going to be smaller but they are going to transform small parts of the value chain small small or small vertical somewhere and as a result they are going to get more and more acceptance so so i don't want to come out or come out as a completely pessimistic of that and i truly believe that and that's one of the thing that i am highlighting is that fourth industrial revolu revolution has to be built built on blockchain ai and iot and they are, they can work together quite well and i know some very good work is being done on ai and iot side um blockchain is going to come up at some point um from a, th a theoretical point of view what can make blockchain more applicable one is that you know um instead of having one proof of work one consensus system how about having many consensus systems and come up with a uh come up with a way to combine different consensus systems together so branching and tiered proof i know somebody who is working on that and i am very hopeful that is going to be the next theoretical breakthrough on blockchain world thank you very much and uh, for giving me the opportunity i am open to questions right now thank you partho so uh, students you can ask questions so sir uh, i had a couple of questions yeah uh, uh, the first question is that uh, since this is a decentralized mechanism uh, the blockchain thing mm -hmm. then uh, what what does it uh, mean for the government of the future i mean if they, if the if the things are decentralized then how do the like the how do the trans transactions get uh, like registered mm -hmm. and how are they subject to taxations that is my first question and the second question uh, and the second question is that uh, this uh, blockchain uh, uh, research and uh, implementation is a very expensive thing as you mentioned and mm -hmm. this could mean that that it is susceptible to oligopolistic structures oh yeah mm -hmm. so uh, then what uh, what are the implications of that in the in the real world if the, if this becomes the financial mechanism of the future what are the implications very good question very good question thank you for asking that what's your name please uh, who's I'm, that i'm obinandan obinandan okay thank you obinandan for uh, saying that um for first uh, thing is that you know uh, um is it is it taxed yes in us it is already taxed it's a, uh, it's a, a financial asset and you are being taxed um can it be can it uh, replace currency like us dollar or indian rupee no you, you cannot why not because any crypto um, any cryptocurrency is or at least the bitcoin bitcoin is a pure or uh, fiat currency there is nothing uh, supporting that you can argue us dollar is also fiat currency but it has the uh, it has the credit of the us government behind it that's an import trust and credit of the us government behind it same with you know indian rupees trust and credit of the indian government behind it 
that's a very important thing. And uh, that's why uh, I told you that the, the trust issue comes in and Bitcoin is completely trustless. And I do not expect any uh, uh, any cryptocurrency to be the complete transaction, the only currency in the world or, or say major country for the, uh, first of all, I said, I, I mentioned why Bitcoin cannot be because Bitcoin has structural deficiencies, but if you can theoretically design a cryptocurrency without that trust, structural deficiency, and if you could, even then it would not have the trust and credit of a recognized government behind it. And uh, that is why I think it is not going to be the currency of the future. Is it going to be a medium of transactions? Surely it can, surely it can. Um, the medium of transactions and in some cases it is and I would argue as one of the assigned, our assigned reading says that it is the medium of, trans medium of transferring money from China into outside world and I think there's a lot of validity to that. So uh, 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 that's the second point and third point you said is the, the oligopolis oligopolistic structure. Uh, thankfully the research on, on on blockchain is still at the university level, and all the uh, all the uh, industry groups that I mentioned before, they are still essentially what they are trying to do is uh, trying to come up with a, uh, with different APIs. I'm being facetious, but that's what they're doing. They're coming up with various APIs, and it's not going to be too difficult to 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 counter those uh, counter them because of the stuff uh, you know something better comes up so i'm not too pessimistic on that but having said that uh, cryptocurrency world by itself has uh, shown that it has been it can be controlled by oligopolis oligopolistic interest for example right now bitcoin has only six or seven major pools they uh, they control 85 percent of total Bitcoins in the world. So yes, it has, it has already been done um, in the cryptocurrency world. In the research world, it is still not done. And um, it is being taxed. And uh, I don't think there's going to be any cryptocurrency that is going to be the only currency uh, of a major country, at least for some time. So you said that the uh, medium, uh, uh, like it can be a medium of transaction. So yeah. you said that uh, the United States, in the United States, this uh, this is taxable. How do they get around the fact that the identities are like uh, not revealed in that in that sense? How do they? How do they um, it's a yeah, great point. It's a, uh, that's also um, uh, that's all. You have to reveal your holding of 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 Bitcoin, and uh, that's a very good point that um, I. Uh, you can take it to the um, the legal people. How do you define? And that's not exactly clear. And uh, you have to reveal your holding of cryptocurrency. Now, of course, there's a huge amount of you know uh, question whether you can you can track it properly. I completely agree with you. Yeah, because uh, if if it, uh, like up till now it, it is like concentrated in the hands of a few people, so you can keep track of that. But if it right. on a mass scale, then it is more susceptible to like yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's um, it's an anonymous world, so it cannot be tracked. So you have to you have to question whether you can really do that properly. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so if there are no other questions at this point, then uh, I will thank Partho once again. Thank you, Professor Mumaji. Dying and making such a fantastic presentation. It has been very informative. Yeah. And if there are questions in future, I will pass it on to you if you can find some time. To Absolutely, respond. I will do. And once again, thank you, Professor Mumaji, and thank you, uh, uh, students and. Uh, Blockchain is an, a very exciting place. I mean, and don't get disheartened. I, I am not disheartened. I'm, all, all, I am into my second blockchain uh, uh, startup. So, but you have to be very realistic what blockchain is and what it can or cannot do. And with that, I, the same thing with everything. I mean, that's the beauty of ISA education. That ISA education teaches you to be uh, to be. Uh, skeptical of, of you have to prove to me and that's a fantastic reading and 
thank you professor mukherjee for giving me the opportunity okay thank you so we will close the session now okay all right have a wonderful evening gentlemen and ladies wednesday morning we have usual class at usual time all right i'm signing off thanks